Hello and welcome to the Car Cameras Reviews channel and welcome to the 2024 Mazda CX-90 plug-in hybrid model. We have previously reviewed the inline six model and we did a really in-depth review, the technical side and everything. And we determined that the inline six was a little too complicated for the real world. But in today's video, we wanna check out the plug-in hybrid model because it doesn't have the inline six, it has a completely different powertrain. And in today's video, we're gonna do a proper technical review under the hood. We're gonna take a look underneath the car. We're gonna take a quick tour around the car because it is essentially the same as the inline six. We're gonna talk about some things we do not like, some things we do like, and if you should buy the plug-in hybrid model over the inline six right after this. Let's start our technical review with the plug-in hybrid system on the CX-90. Very interesting system. I think it has some pretty unique stuff in it. Let us dive in. So let's start with the engine first. The engine here is not an inline six. It is a four cylinder 2.5 liter direct injected non-turbo engine. This is actually not a new engine for this, for Mazda. It is the same 2.5 that they have used in almost all their cars up to the point where the inline six came out. A brief summary of its mechanical construction, plastic valve cover, pretty high quality plastic valve cover, which I really like. And the cylinder head is one piece, hydraulic lifters, roller rockers, all the good stuff. This does have dual variable valve timing. The intake one is an electric one. So electric motor kind of connected to the inside of the, of the timing gear. It's, if the motor speeds up faster than the camshaft speed, it advances the timing. If it slows down, it retards the timing. If it spins at the same speed, it's base timing. This is something that is not new. The Mazda actually pioneered this and they, they've been really doing it in all their cars for a while now and everybody's kind of following suit slowly. This engine is designated as PYUL, just for you to know its name. And it is a pretty interesting engine. It's very old school, actually. It is direct injected only, which carbon buildup is a possibility, but they don't have the injectors on top of the valve cover like many manufacturers are going towards. It actually have it right underneath the intake manifold, a much better place for them and makes service very simple. The other thing is the high pressure fuel pump actually sits on the side of the valve cover, not even on top of it. They just have a little housing it's driven by the camshaft. Things are very basic. The only thing about this engine is it is in the longitudinal orientation. So basically this mimics a rear wheel drive car that has all wheel drive in the front. So because this car was designed for the inline six and they wanted the inline six to be as far back as possible. So it's not a lot of weight hanging over in front of the axles. This engine is pushed way back and access to the back is a little bit difficult, but it's not as much as the inline six. I mean, there is a lot of room in this engine bay, a lot of room here, which is very interesting to see. Of course, this engine is not turbocharged or anything. The cooling system on this engine is extremely simple. It has a mechanical water pump with a stretch belt. And that's actually the only belt on this engine. And as, we, as we'll talk about the whole hybrid system as a whole, you'll see why there's only one little stretch belt and that's it. I mean, it is so wide open in the front to see that water pump and see the belt, see all the little details, it's pretty interesting. But let's dive into the hybrid system and I think that's what's unique here. This is a parallel hybrid system. What that means is, and let me translate into English, it's a two clutch system and let me translate it into simpler English. You have the engine and then you have the eight speed transmission. We'll talk about the transmission a little bit. In between them, there's not a torque converter. There's actually an electric motor and that's the only electric motor here. But in between the engine and this electric motor, there's a clutch. And then in between this motor and the transmission, there is another clutch. So that you have two clutches. This is usually not the case. Usually they have only one clutch separating the, trans the engine but this one has two clutches. And the way this operates is very interesting. And this is, I think, where they're onto something here, which is really good. It has drive modes. So let's talk about some of these drive modes so this will start to make sense. When you are in EV mode, engine is off, the clutch between the engine and the motor 
it's just disengaged. Nothing is connected. The engine is just sitting here. But the clutch between the motor and the transmission is engaged. So now the motor, when you energize it, it's going to spin the transmission. But here's the interesting thing. Usually, plug-in hybrids, they either have some form of an ECBT or something like that, or they just have the transmission sit in one speed, because the electric motor has plenty of torque, it can actually take off the car. But this one, it actually shifts the transmission. And it's something extremely strange when you drive it. It's, it's not strange in a bad way. It's just like, oh wow, this is like a normal car just shifting and the electric motor is driving. It's very, very interesting. And then the second driving mode is gonna be the hybrid. So you're kind of using both either way. So the engine, has two starting possibilities. You can either start it with a starter, it does have a starter, in certain driving conditions or certain weather conditions, it'll actually start using the starter, or it can use the electric motor to start the engine. So when you're driving in hybrid, you're, you're an EV and you're switching to hybrid mode, the electric, let's say the electric motor was gonna start the engine. The electric motor will disengage from the transmission the clutch between the transmission and electric motor will disengage. The clutch between the electric motor and the engine will engage. The electric motor will spin the engine up to the speed of the transmission, start the engine, and then the second clutch between the motor and the transmission will also engage. So now the engine is driving the motor and driving the transmission directly. If you need a lot of power and the battery is sufficiently charged, it's actually gonna apply power to the motor. So now the engine and the motor is driving the transmission and driving the car. But then the, the other mode is if the battery is low on charge and it needs to be charged, well, the engine now is mechanically connected to this motor and mechanically connected to the transmission. So the motor is gonna be spun by the engine to generate and charge the battery. Pretty interesting principle. If you are doing regenerative braking, you're pressing the brake, it's not gonna use the hydraulic brakes immediately, it's gonna actually charge the battery. It's gonna disengage the engine, shut it off, disengage the clutch between the engine and the motor, and then the road force or the driving force of the road will spin the transmission, which will then spin the motor because the clutch is engaged and it's gonna charge the battery. It's actually a very interesting thing. The biggest thing is here, you have two clutches. I think that is the biggest thing about this system that I don't see in a lot of other systems, at least the ones that we have reviewed, because you can drive the transmission and have that transmission shift while you are in EV mode. That is something huge, folks, and it makes a huge difference. Now, this system is all-wheel drive, but it is not all-wheel drive in the normal fashion of hybrids and plug-in hybrids. It's actually the old-school way, the inefficient way, unfortunately. Because this is a longitudinal orientation, you can't really drive the front wheels and then have another motor in the back. That's just not possible. So, I actually did it the old-school way. The eight-speed transmission, which is just a conventional eight-speed transmission, nothing really special about it, you know, hydraulic fluid and whatnot. It has a drive shaft that drives the rear differential. And then there is a transfer case that sends power to the front wheel, to the front differential, which then sends power to the front wheels. But here is the interesting thing, because this is longitudinal, you don't have enough space because the engine sits so far back to pass the axle through. So they actually put the differential, then one axle passes through the oil pan and then goes to the other side. Now this is not just Mazda, this is basically every single car that is in this orientation that is all-wheel drive. It will have to do that because there's no way to pass that axle through the end, other than through the engine to go to the other side. The HVAC system here, usually in plug-in hybrids, is very important because when you're driving in EV mode, well, how are you gonna cool the battery, heat the battery? How are you gonna cool the cabin, heat the cabin? So HVAC systems and plug-in hybrids, they're not like electric cars, but they're usually a little bit up and up because that's really what affects the range. Here's what they did here. They kept things extremely simple. So this has a normal HVAC system. Engine comes on, warms up the coolant, coolant warms up the cabin, life is good. AC compressor is electric here, unlike the inline six. This is an electric compressor, nothing special about it. That comes on, cools the cabin, and life is great. The battery is a lithium ion battery. Now, the second problem with electric cars and plug-in hybrids, the same thing, is how do you cool and 
warm up the battery. Here, they did something very interesting. So, refrigerant goes straight to the battery to cool it. This is the most efficient way. It's a little bit complicated in the sakes of piping and whatnot, but it is very efficient. You don't have a battery chiller and you don't have all that. You just have AC lines going straight to the battery and that cools it. To warm up the battery, they actually followed suit in Toyota's land. This is a, possibly one of the only companies that does it this way, also with the refrigerant cooling the battery. And then they have an electric heater inside the battery that just comes on, warms up the battery, and we're good. It's not the most efficient way, but again, this is not an electric car. So should things get complicated, well, the engine can come on and we have instant heat and we're good. But they went a step further than that, because this car, usually plug-in hybrids will have some sort of a heat pump system, which is very efficient and works great up to 10 negative. 14 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere around there but here they didn't do that because what happens when you need to heat up the cabin when you're driving in EV mode they actually put a water heater so that water heater is going to warm up the coolant which then will supply heat to the interior not as efficient but it works in a plug-in hybrid now put that in an electric car we have major problems because electric cars should be able to harvest their energy, their heat a little bit better than this. But plug-in hybrid, this is pretty acceptable. Now this car has two cooling systems. One of them is from the engine, very simple, nothing really special about it. The second one is actually a dedicated system for the inverter. The, the inverter is what sends power to the, to the motor, takes power to charge the battery and does all this stuff. DC to DC converter, because this engine does not have an alternator, the DC to DC converter basically takes that high voltage from the high voltage battery, steps it down to 12 volts so we can char power up all the accessories, charge the 12 volt battery, which proudly sits under the hood, which is very good, not hidden somewhere in the back and whatnot. And then it also ch cools the onboard charger so you can plug it in and charge the battery and have some EV range and the motor itself and the transmission they're all in one circuit now this circuit has its own electric water pump not its own radiator and that's the interesting part it is technically but not exactly and this is something very clever that they did here so the radiator is actually one radiator it's one unit but it's actually split the top portion is the other circuit and the bottom portion is the engine one. Now this is good and bad. Good because you don't have two physical radiators and all the piping for them and all the complication. Bad because if you have one of them leaking, like you just have a rock that hit one of them, you have to replace both. You have to drain and service both systems at the same time and it does add a little bit of cost. But in the end, I would prefer it that way. It's just one radiator that does everything and we're done. We don't have 17 radiators in the front. Now this car does have a very cool feature, which is a charge charge mode. But most plug-in hybrids, charge mode is just a button. You press it, engine will come on, it'll start charging the battery. Here, you can actually select how much you want it to charge the battery, which percentage, which I thought was pretty cool, pretty clear button, and then you make a selection. Now this system sounds incredible, right? Things are just cutting edge in a good way, and for the most part, that is correct on paper. When you go drive this car, though, and, and test out the system, it is, yeah, we have some problems, some serious problems here. The biggest problem is it is extremely clunky and slow. What I mean by clunky is you accelerate, there's like a jarring feeling. Not always, but for a plug-in hybrid, for such a beautiful car, it's not very refined. And the biggest problem is if you're driving in EV mode, for example, and you demand like high acceleration, all of a sudden you want to take over somebody or you're merging into a highway, you accelerate, it's going to take the system up to three seconds to really get going because it's going to disengage the clutch from the transmission, engage the clutch of the engine, rev up the motor to rev up the engine, start it, then engage, and then we're going. I mean, it's very slow. And then all of a sudden you let go of the gas, it's kind of like jerks, shuts off the engine, starts charging. You feel every single transition. And that's not good in plug-in hybrids because it makes the car always jarring. And that's not the norm. We're not just figuring out how plug-in hybrids work. Plug-in hybrids are pretty much here and 
they've gotten really good and this is not really up there with how smooth things are technology wise and like design wise it is and i think it's groundbreaking actually but execution wise and in the real world it's not so good and the other thing is the electric motor usually you know you drive evs or you drive even plug-in hybrids you'll feel you'll hear the electric motor but it's not very loud slight whining when you decelerate and brake for the regeneration this one is extremely loud i mean you're in ev mode and you just creep a little bit it's very 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 loud the motor it is so loud that one of the coolest things about it how it shifts the transmission in ev mode you will feel every single thing because you can hear it it's extremely loud usually one of the nicest things about plug-in hybrids is when you're in ev mode it's very quiet not this one it's very loud it's almost as loud as the engine and that's where things could use refinement I can, they were really onto something here but the execution the final execution with the smoothness and the transitions it could really use a lot of work here folks advertised range of this e in this plug-in hybrid is 26 miles on a full charge in ideal conditions of course if it's too cold too hot it might drop a little bit this is not very high for plug-in hybrids of today but again this is a massive car that is very it's very large it's swoopy and all that for aerodynamic but still it's a high suv and it's a big suv so i suppose that is acceptable however i can't, i just can't get past how clunky the system is unfortunately i really like all the technology and everything that went into it i love hearing that that electric motor shifting the transmission but things could use some refinement here because this is such a beautiful car and really deserves a super smooth and refined plug-in hybrid system and lastly as a mechanic looking around let's get past the technology and the nerdy stuff here first of all you can really tell as soon as you pull the cover and look you can really tell a much bigger engine was supposed to go here and you don't have it because there is an alarming amount of space and by alarming i mean a very welcome because working in the front of this engine is extremely simple i mean you have so much space and that is really good now this is unlike the inline six where every little thing oh engine has to come out not in here you could do it actually a lot the only concern is we talked about it a little bit the engine is pushed back so access to the very back including the the high pressure fuel pump is a little bit on the difficult side but overall this is way better than the inline six there's way more room it's not turbocharged things are much simpler especially with the engine and this is really good now as far as materials and kind of quality of things i really like what i see here mazda lately has been really doing things well in this area right here there's nothing flimsy there's nothing cheap everything is just solid and good feeling and that's important folks most people are so focused on interior and gizmos and all that nobody really looks here this is what's going to break your bank or not and in that department this is definitely better than the inline six the inline six they uh, got a little carried away this one is a lot better and plus this engine is not some all new high-tech engine it's an engine they've used for years and years and it does have a track record let's take a look underneath the cx90 plug-in hybrid this is entirely covered this is one of the most covered cars i have seen up to date I mean, they really did a good job covering everything here. I mean, the front's completely covered. All you have here is a little piece of the subframe where you can lift it up from. But what I love about their covering is they did leave you an opening for regular service, oil changes and whatnot. And even when you look on the side here, things are very well covered. Look, look at this cover. This usually doesn't exist in other cars. This part, they really did it extremely well. Now let's look at the front suspension. So this is a double wishbone suspension, but this very interesting suspension here. So you do have an upper control arm that is actually steel. You can see it from here. It is a steel control arm. Now the knuckle is aluminum. The control arm at the bottom, it's actually a two piece. Half of it is steel, half of it is aluminum. That's a pretty interesting setup there. You have a dual piston caliper in the front. It's actually a pretty decent sized caliper here. There's one note, the lower pole joint is actually part of the control arm. You can't separate it. And that is the same thing at the top. I wish they would have just flipped this and made it a little bit better for service. They didn't, and that's okay. 
But then as we move back, there's this very interesting uh, looking cover here. It's riveted on. I believe this is where the catalytic converter would be. I mean, you can't even tell anything here. You usually will not see car manufacturers cover up the exhaust like this. I mean, if you come, come around and look, it's not like the exhaust immediately goes up. It's right here. And they have heavy shielding on this plastic so it wouldn't melt from the heat. This is very impressive. You will not see a lot of gasoline cars that are this covered up. Now, I believe this shield has to do with that. It's just to radiate the heat outside from the exhaust because it's completely covered up. I mean, the covers go all the way across. Now, because of the covers, unfortunately, we will not be able to see a lot, but just to give you an idea of the construction, this battery is a pretty interesting battery, and same thing with the fuel tank. It's a saddle battery. It has a very strange appearance. It's basically two modules and then a bridge between them. So the battery is actually in this area, right here. You can see the AC lines that we talked about for the cooling, they're right here. And then on this side, if you open it up a little bit, you'll see another coolant line. Another AC line that goes to the sep to the other module. And then here you have a saddle fuel tank. I love this packaging. It just this part they did really well. You notice there's this very strong brace here just to kind of brace the body and give you a little bit of extra protection. Everything feels very high quality, including the exhaust. I really like the quality of this exhaust. The shielding, everything is really done well here. And then we get up to the back. You don't see that in a lot of cars. And that is the part that I wish they would carry on to other models. Now, the rear differential you can see. Again, we talked about this being really an interesting setup. This is a very large differential. I mean, look how huge it is. And this doesn't even have like the disconnect mechanism that's in the transfer case. But it does have these two fins that stick out. I feel like that's gonna get caught. And that's the only thing. But even the control arms are, have like an over elaborate covering to it for aerodynamic they really went all out with this folks and they did it i think in my opinion did it well this is everything you touch here and feel it just feels well made now the rear suspension and the multi-link suspension can't really see much of it if we come here maybe we'll see a little bit it's also a co an interesting combination of some steel control arms some aluminum control arms and then the knuckle is aluminum it does have a single piston caliper in the back with a electronic parking brake on it so that is pretty interesting but then we look at the typical automotive industry stuff you notice they put some coverings here but not completely all the way which is better than nothing same thing on this side you notice they put some coverings not 100 percent but i feel like they were not really following the trends of the automotive industry with this car they just wanted to make something out of this world and they in some aspects they did especially in the looks department underneath things look really well i mean you will not see many cars even some really high-end luxury cars with metal covers right around the differential area i just wish this fin was a little bit they needed the extra cooling but maybe put it on the side so it wouldn't stick out because i feel like this is going to get caught if you go some off-roading Let's take a look at the outside and the inside in one go because the plug-in hybrid model is actually exactly the same as the inline six model, which we have already reviewed, but we're going to talk about some highlights. I mean, just look at it. The best thing about the CX-90 is how it looks, both inside and out. This is a beautiful looking car. I mean, it is classy. It is less is more emphasized i mean look at this headlight when you look at it close up i mean there's not much going on with it but in the grand scheme of things it just looks so elegant look at this little line that is lit and then the way the grill just kind of comes out and starts yes it is a massive grill but it doesn't look out of place and if you notice there's these dips in the bumper here that gives it this this character it's a very classy design that is not overdone and you look at the hood there's not very strange lines there's just one main line one main line very tiny line here that disappears and that's about it it even has this very strange corner over here of the hood so the hood comes down and it makes a little cut and then goes away then you look at the side now this is something with the cx90 that they're doing they would write inline six here this one says 
plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Very interesting. And then you look at the side profile. There is absolutely nothing. It's just, and that's the beauty part of it. I think this is one of the greatest looking cars to come out in these times from a company that is really trying to change their previous image. It was not a bad image, but they're trying to enter the luxury market. And nothing says luxury more than this look. It is very elegant. Now, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. You can lock the doors from the front, but you can't do it from the back. Given the price of this particular one, I don't think that is the end of the world, but if we're going into the luxury direction, I think this would be a really nice touch. But what is really a nice touch, and most people might not notice. So most cars, you open the back door, you know, this is plenty of space to pack. This is a pretty tall door, but watch what Mazda did here. This is almost 90 degrees. I mean, this gives you huge space to get into the car, makes it very comfortable to get in and out of it. I love this. This is, this every car should have this. Now they don't have the same in the front, but the entry in the front is still plenty wide for you to get in. Now we go, we go to the back and this is where, again, less is more. I mean, this is, a very good looking car. The only concern I have about this, because of this shape and this kind of elegant design, the window is actually not that big. This belt line is very high. The window is not the biggest, but that's the only thing. It is a beautiful looking car. Now, just like all new cars, this is something that's becoming kind of the fashion. The back door is very close to the bumper, like there's no bumper at all. So any hit, you may damage the back door. That is one thing we're seeing with the automotive industry pretty much all around. Badging is medium on this, CX-90 all-wheel drive, E Sky Active plug-in hybrid vehicle. It's a bit much, but that's how everybody is. This is really on the lower side of things. But then being a plug-in hybrid, you have fuel door and you have a kind of a charge door. This is the fuel door. Let's go look at the charge door because that's really what's different. Pretty massive door and it is covered, which I like. This is how it should be. But they always could do this a little bit better. I mean, this is a door you can access frequently to charge your plug-in hybrid. And this is not just Mazda. I'm seeing almost everybody. Some companies really get this right. Mazda, I guess join the ones that this is a little bit on the flimsy side. But let's take a look at the inside because this is, I think, where things are interesting. I mean, this interior is, the first thing about it is, it's very comfortable. And when you look at a car like this and they're heading all in the luxury direction, I feel like they did not go over the top here and for a good reason. All physical controls for your HVAC. The infotainment system is a little bit confusing to me in the plug-in hybrid. Let's talk about it a little bit just for you to get an idea. Correct me if I'm wrong because I could not really get an accurate answer on this one. So this has a Rory dial, but in the inline six model, the 12 inch screen, it was touch screen. But in this one, it is a 12 inch model and it is not touch screen. The smaller screen is not touch screen, but the bigger one is supposed to be, but in the plug-in hybrid model, this particular one is not touchscreen, so it's a little bit creates a confusion for us here. Rory dial works fine, but it is nice to have the touchscreen in addition to the Rory dial because this is, uh, you know, Rory dial with wireless Apple CarPlay, which most of one does have, it gets a little much. Sometimes you just want to change an option and that's it. Now the materials here, they're nice, but they're not the top. I mean, this is... The leather is a little bit on the drier side. It's not the nicest leather out there, but again, considering the price of this car, this is okay. But the fit to finish here is, folks, is impeccable. This is something to be said. I mean, everything here is very well put together and that's what you expect. This material here, this, I don't think this is really real wood, a wood veneer, if you would, uh, at best. It looks very nice and very classy. It's not over the top. It's not all over the dash and all over. It's a little bit on the doors. 
little bit here. It just gives it a hint of nice, but not over the top. Center console open both ways. It is tiny though, because this does have a very deep tunnel because there's a lot of real estate going on. It is small, but I suppose it works. Now, the gauge is also a full screen that doesn't really do much other than display multiple information. So don't expect a lot with the screen. And that's how it is with the CX-90. Let's talk about some things I do not like about the 2024 Mazda CX-90 plug-in hybrid model. The biggest thing is the plug-in hybrid model part. While this system, this plug-in hybrid system is very sophisticated and it actually has a lot of cool features and cool designs and things that are really groundbreaking, it is extremely clunky. That's the best way to put it. It really needs more refinement on the transition of things between modes. You feel every transition and occasionally it just kind of hangs up to line everything up to go and it's something you really feel on a daily drive regardless if you have a heavy foot or you're driving conservatively or you're just driving normally you will always feel the powertrain just not smooth and that could really use some improvements here and the other thing and this is really not specific to the plug-in hybrid model the smart key access or the keyless go access when you, it's only in the front doors not the rear doors i mean we're going after a luxury car theme that would have been something really nice to have simple to add i i must add but it would be nice to have but the biggest concern about the interior while the interior is just fabulous the shifter i don't know why they decided to have the park be on the left side where you have to move it physically so it really has a steep learning curve. And if you're in a hurry, you're trying to make multi-point multi turns, if you just bump the shifter, it'll go into park and now you have you stop and you have to go. It just is not the best idea. I wish the park was just a button. That would have worked too. And then here's an interesting thing that since we did the inline six model and now we did this one, I discovered it in this one. If you're in reverse or drive and you, most people are kind of used to pushing the shifter forward and we're in park, you're busy, you're on the phone, you have kids yelling, you throw it and you don't think that you have to move it to the left. You shut off the car, it'll actually engage park and it'll tell you anti roll away engaged and you walk away, lock the car, we're great, life's good. Then you come the next time you start, it won't start. The lights will come on and it will tell you shift into park. And you'll be like, what? What do you mean shift into park? Oh, we have to move the shifter to the left. Very confusing shifter that is totally unnecessary, but we have it. It works, but could be better. We're going to need to sit down for this one, folks, because this one is really difficult to say. I love this car. And I love the direction that Mazda is going lately with their proper luxury car and they're really doing it at prices that are not proper luxury car prices. I wish Mazda is listening right now because this is not criticism. This is actually feedback from someone who genuinely cares. I love everything about this car from the way it looks to the way it feels when you sit inside of it. From everything, looking around everything, I can tell that folks at Mazda really poured their heart into this one. But here is the truth. This beautiful car from the looks and the feel and everything really needs the refinement on this powertrain. More here than in the inline six, but even in the inline six, things are just too clunky. They felt like experimental and, and that's a problem. In 2024, there are so many hybrids and plug-in hybrids that are so good that it's a, it's, it really pains me that a car this beautiful and this well thought out and they really thought about everything and they spent so much time and they did things so well elsewhere but in the powertrain it really needs work and on top of that there are some areas are done so well but some areas are not like the door closing sounds it could use real improvement and this is simple stuff but this is what consumer will 
will look at. You close the door, it just doesn't inspire luxury. Now, having said that, not everything about this plug-in hybrid system is just clunky and needs refinement and all that. There are some very groundbreaking stuff like the two clutches. That's not the norm in parallel hybrids. Usually you have one clutch, this one has two. And the feeling of driving it in EV mode and the transmission shifting with no engine running, is something, you're onto something here. This is just I always thought, why don't they do it this way where the electric motor drives a regular transmission and the transmission shifts just like an engine would be. And here it is. They're really onto something with this, but I feel like if they make a revision to this system, improve some of its clunkiness, they're onto something. This, to me, as a mechanic, as just an average Joe on the street, this is a lot more like it than the inline six. The inline six headed towards BMW side so much that it scared a lot of folks. I am one of them. It was way too complicated. Things here, they are complicated because this is a plug-in hybrid after all, but they're not as the level of complication of the inline six. And this still drives fine other than the clunky powertrain, but when it is not clunky and everything is engaged and going, doesn't lack power. It's pretty smooth, it's pretty quiet. and. That's why I say, I think this will be the winner here. If they work on smoothing out the powertrain a little bit, everything else we can live with. No car is perfect, of course, but this is such a beautiful car. Just needs some work on that, refining that powertrain, folks. And as far as reliability, without a doubt, I feel like long-term, this may be better than the inline six, simply because the inline six is just as beautiful as that engine engineering is. It's just too complicated for the real world. And that is something we talked about in the previous review. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.